I'm Pat Prescott. For most Americans, owning a home is the key to wealth accumulation. A home is the most valuable thing most people will ever own. Black people have been homeowners in some form or other since the emancipation of the enslaved Africans, but not on the same terms as white people. It's a chronic problem that stretches back for decades. Housing discrimination was a key part of the Jim Crow laws that enforced racial segregation after slavery. Redlining was popular during the New Deal, a discriminatory lending practice that gave money to builders to build communities that expressly excluded black home buyers. It's no longer legal, but it still happens today. In the 20s, there was a rule in the real estate industry that any broker who sold a house in a white neighborhood to a black family would lose their license. Non-whites were only allowed to live in substandard homes and neighborhoods. And even when blacks successfully established their own segregated neighborhoods, we saw situations like the Tulsa riots, where black neighborhoods were burned to the ground, as if their success was unacceptable, too. Here's the bottom line. We live in a society in which homeownership is the key to the good life, and African Americans have not had fair access to it. Tonight, we'll take a look at housing discrimination and some interesting solutions for fixing it. This is Justice Now. Justice Now. 94 7 The Wave's ongoing pursuit to bring communities to unity. Decades of housing discrimination have helped create an enormous wealth gap between white and black families. The enduring legacy of redlining, the legal government-sponsored effort to deny mortgages and home ownership opportunities to African Americans and other minorities continues to undermine their quality of life. This violation of basic civil rights continues to negatively impact educational attainment, health outcomes, wealth accumulation, self-esteem, mortality rates, and civic engagement. Homeownership has proved to be both the doorway and gatekeeper to success and well-being in America. It is at the core of today's racial wealth gap. There's a very powerful myth in this country, and that is that residential segregation in this country is something we call de facto segregation something that happened by accident. Every textbook that's used in American high schools and middle schools today lies about this history. It talks about how northern cities were de facto segregated without government involvement. Uh, They talk about uh, how the Federal Housing Administration did a wonderful job of creating single-family homes in the suburbs for working-class families without mentioning that the working-class families that created these homes for could only be white. Lori Gay is the president and CEO of Neighborhood Housing Services of L.A. County. They are a nonprofit lender, developer, and neighborhood revitalization corporation. This year, Lori celebrates 30 wonderful years of doing this work that she has dedicated her life to helping people of color to become financially literate and to invest in our communities and in their own generational wealth. Lori is a dedicated collaborator who gets it done because she knows how to work with others to find solutions for the challenges that are brought about by housing discrimination and barriers to home ownership. Uh, We couldn't do this show without you. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Lori. Thank you, Pat. So tell us, what are some present day examples of housing discrimination? A lot of people think that this is a thing of the past, but no, indeed. (laughs) Well, the truth is that the home ownership rate for blacks in Los Angeles is half that of whites. And that Latinos, um, as newer to the discussion, are, have already surpassed blacks in terms of ownership rates. Why is so that? Just stick, you stick with L.A., right? What we know, our region. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think that is, though? Yeah, we have barriers that are both systemic and perceived. And so we talk about the three A's in the business of housing, accessibility, affordability, availability. And if, in fact, we've had a cultural norm of going into the bank to do business, and then there are fewer bank branches, and then when we go into the bank to do business, people don't look like us, right? There's all kinds of perceived notions of bias. Then we have the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data that tells us what the biases are because the banks are not lending 
at a priority to people of color as their first shift, but mainly blacks are at the bottom of the rung. We're 1% of net worth of uh, whites in Los Angeles. So all those things tell us that there have been systems that have precluded people from borrowing. Everybody's not bad. Everybody's not dumb. Yeah, and and home ownership is really the beginning of of establishing generational wealth, certainly. And when you're shut out of that, then that becomes a huge problem moving forward. And I think that's what has happened here. I mean, we've got generation after generation of of systemic discrimination. And people think that because we've got the Fair Housing Act and HUD and all these other things, these were established to help homeowners, but only if you're a white homeowner. (laughs) <laughs> Talk and about the historical thing, the whole, you know, yeah. the whole historical picture. Well, just, you know, our Federal Housing Administration, FHA, those things were created as a part of the civil rights movement to make sure that redlining and restrictive covenants, which precluded primarily blacks from buying in neighborhoods throughout this country, um, were eliminated. The goal was to eliminate all that and equalize it. But the problem you have is that when for 40 or 50 years or hundreds of years, uh, people were told where they could live only in certain geographies and in major urban spaces, there was what we call the ring around the city where black and brown families and some API communities were pushed out into what are now suburbs, but they weren't suburbs back then. It was, un, you know, the, the land was, was not built out. It was, there was no infrastructure. That's where we were told we could live, but don't come into the city where all the benefits are. And so as that began to change, then whites flight happened and people moved out to the suburbs and built those up. So unfortunately, the race conversation always makes it seem one sided. But the truth is, you watch the money, follow the money. And when people uh, now are seeing that the appraised value of a home in any neighborhood in America where there are black and brown people might be devalued $47,000 a unit, we're a mess. And so how do we change that, include the race filter where it's appropriate because we've struggled with it, and then talk about the economics of things so that in fact, we encourage all families to participate in building their wealth. Yeah, great example of, of what you're talking about, too, is, is gentrification. Uh, the fact yes. that, you know, a lot I know in, in the neighborhood that I live in, uh, in Baldwin Vista, you know, we have seen our property values almost double because of all of our new neighbors who are moving in. And it's because now people are more attracted to living back in the city again. The West yeah. Side is out of control in terms of the prices. And here is this great little neighborhood. We didn't know about Ladera Heights and about La Mert Park and all of these places, and now they are in play. And and how do we how do we deal with the idea of gentrification in our neighborhoods? And, and is this something that we need to worry about? Is this really a problem? Yeah, it's a problem. And I think again, race always gets pushed to the forefront because we all hate talking about it, so we talk about it behind closed doors. But economic gentrification is usually what's happening first, and so a neighborhood might be devalued uh, over time. And so it's where people of modest means live because they don't have the same resources to live at the beach, you know, in some near looking chateau or village. Or I can get a whole lot more for my money. (laughs) Yes, yes. So they can get I was in Memphis recently and a corner property, almost an acre of land. uh, The person had bought it for twenty three thousand dollars. We don't know anything about that out here in the West. And so people lived where they could afford. Once they were told they didn't have to live outside the city, back to that history of discrimination and redlining. And so as they moved into cities and urban spaces that weren't looking so great anymore, and then they fix them up and take care of them, you fast forward to today, they've taken care of properties for 50 and 80 years, and now it's popular and hot again for families who make more. Um, In my neighborhood, same thing, Pat. And they were moving back, and they have the resources to do it, I've continued to say the worst thing about gentrification is the tone. If you're middle class and you move back to a neighborhood, be nice. Yeah. And understand that someone else preserved that for all the years of interest that you might have. And you're not better than anybody because you could fix it up more than they could. They cared for it for decades so that you might have opportunity. 
Yeah, and I think another thing, too, that people seem to overlook is you see the upward mobility of the black middle class, and you think that should change something. Uh, But talk about what black middle class people face as well and the disparities between what we can do as a middle class citizen compared to a white middle class citizen. Well, the tough part there is some of that property valuation piece we mentioned. All people have to do is... um, Google or whatever your platform is, appraisals in black neighborhoods, uh, appraisals in minority neighborhoods, and they'll start to see some of that property piece that's going on right now, where the appraisal community has been devaluing based on race. It's, you know, it's evidence, so read it. The other part is um, that as you trek people's perceptions, so if we deal with our region in Los Angeles, that as you move west, people don't look black as much as some other people groups. And so what happens when they go for that apartment or that home? Uh, are they questioned about being a buppy? You know, and can <laughs> you really afford it? We hear all those questions and we hear people uh, all the time telling us that there's this challenge to the black middle class. The other thing I think about the black middle class that's real is we say the message out loud that it's not bad to stay in the older neighborhoods where your grandmother and grandfather grew up, particularly on the West Coast because of the value of property. Keep it in your portfolio. Don't be so quick to sell it or get rid of it or liquidate it in some way, even if you don't want to live in Crenshaw or Lamert or some other what are now kind of popular neighborhoods and you want to be in Santa Monica, do that, but don't lose your property interest. Keep it and help cultural neighborhoods stay intact and help property values stay at the top of the space they can stay. Well, I know you have some great community partners who have helped your efforts along, and uh, uh, you might want to mention uh, one or two of those. But we also want to know how the Wave family can help you to continue doing what you're doing, your financial literacy classes, all the great workshops you do, the neighborhood cleanups. Your programs are outstanding. We have worked uh, arm in arm on so many of these and will continue to do so moving forward. But what can we do to help you, Lori? Thank you, Pat. We, we just want to ask that you keep putting the message out. People can call us. We're offering free financial counseling online and one-to-one with, a, with kind of your financial coach. And don't lose your home if you own one already or your property if you're a mom, pop, landlord. If you're a renter, a tenant, uh, and someone's discriminating against you in some way or you're worried about that, call us for help. It's free. We're available. Uh, We're doing classes all kinds of times. Just go on our website and find that information. And the more the wave can put that out and have people join us when we're doing stuff in the neighborhood, we're grateful. Some of the partners have been the banking industry, certainly, and uh, City of LA, City of Compton. And we're grateful for that as we're in tough times. And we're adding healthcare partners now because housing equals health. And so I think uh, home matters, Pat, and we don't want to lose that messaging in tough times and know that people care about you. They care and that we're here to help and be available to serve in a time of need. Yeah. And, and would you say something, too, about your about uh, uh, your operation in Compton? I just think it's so wonderful what you've done there. Well, in Compton, you know, we've loved on the great city of Compton and we created the NHS Center for Sustainable Communities three years ago, and it's what we call a collective impact space, where if you come in and you need to see the doctor for your dentistry, but you also need to get information on how to manage your bank account, there's tools for you. So everything from small business to housing, to health, to youth programming, construction management, environmental climate change stuff. I mean, you know, (laughs) we're doing agricultural stuff. It's phenomenal and we've had a great run. And we plan to open as many centers as we can with the help of friends and neighbors. I think it's fantastic. Neighborhood Housing Services of L.A. County doing such a great job for us. Lori Gay at the helm. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Pat. We appreciate you. Discrimination was rampant. It was intentional. It was systemic. Pre-1968, we really wore our two countries. The right to access housing is so fundamental to almost every other thing that we do. It had a devastating impact on inequality in this country. There are riots all over the country in American cities. 
We all know that the roots of injustice run deep. 